What you're about to hear is true. No names have been changed to protect the innocent, the guilty, or anybody in between. Have you heard of Uncle Fester? Probably not. There's no real reason you should know him. Because he's still alive. He's one of those who will become well-known posthumously. But that doesn't mean we want to kill him with this film. Presently, he's very busy building a monument to himself. Let's pay him a visit. My lab. This is my lab. This is my lab. My lab. This is my lab. This is where I do all the experiments that get me into so damn much trouble. Let me tell you, this is a weird place. With indoors rain, earthquakes, tornadoes, and fires. I can turn it on and off by this switch, which is pretty nifty. My ultra-evil lab assistant is running around here somewhere. I used to have a human lab assistant, but that coward snitched on me to the feds to keep his own lousy butt out of jail. Now, I have an inhumane lab assistant instead, who at least knows how to keep his mouth shut. His only drawback is that he's a sadistic killer maniac, but he's real good at watching over the lab. Look, that's him. That's Chucky. He's a rascal. I just wish he'd recognize me a little faster when he's on watchdog duty. While I'm resisting Chucky's homicidal fury, I'd like to tell you a bit about myself. My real name is Steve Preisler. Although I have achieved a certain degree of worldwide infamy under the pseudonym, Uncle Faster. I was born in 58 near Green Bay, Wisconsin. I have two great kids, one dog, a house, and two cars. I am five foot nine inches tall. Weigh 180 pounds. And exercise down at the Y twice a week. I've lost most of my hair. Smoke about a pack or two of camels every week. And I'm single. I'm from a large farming family. Lots of siblings all of whom are upstanding citizens, except for my younger brother, Frank, who spends his time floating around loony bins. Boy, farming's a bitch of a way to make a living. My family is aware of my secret hobby but they have no idea about my global reach. <laughs> the less said, the better. They aren't aware of my regular appearances in the global media. Sat One, MTV, TV Tokyo, and Czech TV. Chucky! Chucky! You name it, I've been on it. 
They think I have just some kind of crackpot sideline. They can't believe I receive royalties. What? People pay for this stuff? You gotta be kidding. <laughs> My day job entails the supervision of the chemical works at an electroplating factory in Green Bay, where I am the chief chemist. <laughs> this is my patented flying formula. <laughs> this job really made my publishing possible in the first place. My boss ought to be charging me rent for the use of the laboratory. When I'm working on a new book, I'll get to work, get a good morning caffeine jolt, and then pound out a page or two on my typewriter and go about my daily work duty. It doesn't take long to get a book done that way. Luckily, my boss has no objection to my book writing activities or anything like that. The only thing my boss demands is that I stay off the local TV and out of the frickin' newspapers. I generally respect his wishes. They don't want the world media camped outside the factory every time there's an event for which Uncle Fester's expert commentary is required. The guys at work are rather entertained reading those little books I write. Yes, indeed they are. A new book always elicits laughter for a few days. And when they see the royalty checks, <laughs> their eyeballs start rolling around in their heads. They start thinking of writing books of their own on topics they're familiar with, like drinking, gambling, and bad marriages. And a favorite thing there, one guy from the corner of the plant, when I walk in the door every morning, laughs. <laughs> every morning when I walk in the plant, he goes. <laughs> Our football team is named after the meatpacking industry, which is real big around here. It's called the Green Bay Packers. For us, football is a religion. It's no coincidence that games are played on Sundays. The head coach is the high priest of the city. While head coaching changes resemble medieval religious strife. Our stadium is not too far away from Green Bay's newest sociological attraction. A slum. Courtesy of the meatpacking plants. <laughs> yes, Green Bay is now the proud owner of a slum. We drove by it the other day. My first book was Secrets of Methamphetamine Manufacture, which I wrote while I was in the slam for cooking meth, of course. That's my bona fides. I must know something about it because I was doing time for doing it. Beyond any doubt, this is the best book ever written on the subject of clandestine chemistry by anyone, anywhere, anytime, period. It's basically a Betty Crocker drug cookbook. It's also my answer to the so-called war on drugs, which is, of course, really a war on citizens. This book has ended the drug war as we know it because it cuts out the middleman, the drug dealer, mm -hmm. by enabling everybody to cook drugs in the safety and privacy of their own homes. Mm -hmm. 
The idea for this book came to me one night when I was in my jail cell watching TV. Barbara Walters was on, doing a story on the evils of terrorist publishing, abuses of the First Amendment, and whatnot. She was in melodramatic, concerned citizen mode. Right then, in my revulsion, I decided <laughs> to write my first book. I yelled down the cell block, watch your face down there. Why don't you pass me down that typewriter? I got a book to write. The second book I wrote was Silent Death, which is a celebration of that ancient and fine art of poisoning. This is the best book on poison since the days of Lucretia Borgia. In the good old days, governments kept poison-making techniques classified. But why should governments have all the fun? I'm jumping on the privatization bandwagon, you know? Silent Death teaches citizens how to prepare poisons themselves. Choosing the right poison for the job is like calling the right play in football. It requires knowledge of the subject and use of psychology to make the right choice. There are several golden rules of rat poisoning, which is only right since most targets are rats anyway. This book provides everything the poisoner needs to know to make the right decision regarding the poisoning. Of course, the most important thing about a poison is that it should do the job well, meaning that the victim dies. Chana Versace, Gucci, Prada, Pierre Cardin, Coco Chanel. J'aime mes cheveux. Et non. I bet you won't see my poisoning recipes on MacGyver. Mon maquillage est mon arsenal. Mes fesses sont en acier. My third book was Home Workshop Explosives. We're talking major fire hazards here. Since Big Brother doesn't trust citizens with whole classes of explosive substances, and since I feel the same way about Big Brother, I wrote this book. Plus, fresh on the heels of my drug book success, my greedy publisher felt it was time for the Uncle Fester treatment of the topic. I actually got the nickname Uncle Fester because I like to cook explosives in my dorm room in college. A half dozen of us would go out to back alleys and detonate explosives. For the sheer pleasure of watching them go off, you understand. Well, hackles were raised often by some residents of the dorm concerning my noxious cooking activities. Gasping for breath, they'd complain. Uncle Fester is following up the dorm again with his nitrogen dioxide. <laughs> So when I started to write books, I just stuck with the nickname. My earliest fans and detractors had coined it, and I wanted to give them something back. My latest book is Vest Busters. Vest Busters explains how to coat bullets with Teflon so they can penetrate police armor with ease. Why the hell did I write that? The FBI and the bat faggots in particular have been getting real cheeky lately. They even managed to execute a tax protester's wife, son, and even the poor sap's dog. <laughs> We are witnessing a zenith in the arrogance of officialdom. <laughs> Uncle Fester thought he'd better put a stop to that kind of behavior. Now, if the authorities use those vests for offensive purposes, they'll have to fear for their own lives. And, as we all know, bullies quickly lose their zest for aggressive activity when they might get their own butts kicked. Vest busters. Your uncle's gift to the domestic. You picked Earth. the wrong cop. You're in the wrong neighborhood. You got the wrong gun. I think you should get a different job because you're a complete failure at this one. <laughs> and get yourself some Best Busters too. 
because your gun is a laughable joke. <laughs> Finished, you're through. What other projects have I in mind? I'm not exactly sure. They come to me one at a time, and I deal with them one at a time. It doesn't just depend on me, you know. Like Diana in her tunnel, Fester makes news in a funnel, in which he precipitates many headaches for the state. Like Diana in her tunnel, Fester makes news in a funnel, in which he precipitates many headaches for the state. After JFK Jr.'s recent dive, another George writer, still alive, stole from Uncle about five pages, ready for copy, easy wages. For a film Quinton made by Debit, Fester never got a credit. He designed a meth lab without equal. I ain't gonna work on no damn sequel. Who is Lyle Swan? Lyle puked on stairs. Lyle puked on walls. Lyle puked on expensive carpets, lining, engineering, school halls. Lyle had a nasty wife who saw no need for Lyle's life. Lyle being a lousy lover, she had another undercover. Sure, Lyle hadn't had sex in years, cuddling up with too much football and too many beers. But death is a little extreme. Fester will explain what I mean. After a spell to think, she concocted a murderous drink, a World War I poison tea. Underground soon wedding vows would be. Lyle couldn't really stop the squirts. Oh my God, my ass, it hurts, it hurts. What the hell did I eat? Why's my butt leaking on the street? Desperate was he to give Fester a ring, the poison expert and a very good thing. Fester reviewed the ugly ale and relayed a bitter tale of love betrayed, poison phosphorus and wives getting laid. At last, Lyle understood the very worst of womanhood. Lyle, no matter how good looking, I'd stop eating her lousy cooking. And that is all that Fester said. And that is all that Fester said. And that is all that Fester said to Lyle Swan, to Lyle Swan, to Lyle Swan, Professor Presumed Dead. <laughs> I'll be calling up the TV station here this morning. They're interested in my video called Cook and Crank with Uncle Fester. I made it so people could understand my recipes without all the technical bookish stuff. Nobody reads today anyway. So, you know, to spread the gospel these days, you gotta be on video. A subsidiary of the Walt Disney Corporation, ABC TV, is interested in using my video for the special they're doing on methamphetamine. The storyline goes, there are these two babes who live together out in the cemetery in a cardboard box.
They're meth fiends, you understand. Of course, they have big breasts, which we really, really like. Having failed to beg enough money to buy drugs, these two babes decide to pull a house burglary. They break the windows of a private residence and go about ransacking it for saleable items. Well, exhausted, they flip on the TV during the burglary bit. Surprise, surprise. Staring out at them from the TV is Uncle Fester. He's hosting his own show, Cooking Crank with Uncle Fester. Well, <laughs> this interests them to no end, you know. So they park their cute little behinds in front of the TV screen and watch Cook and Crank with Uncle Faster. They realize all the stuff they need for cooking meth can be had just by ransacking this guy's house. They learn that instead of stealing stuff to pawn to buy drugs, they can steal everything they need to produce the drugs themselves. It's a morality tale, you understand. The paint thinner, the cold pills, the red devil lie, everything they need to make drugs is right there in that private residence. The homeowner even has a palladium, coin collection, the precious metal catalyst used for the hydrogenation of the ephedrine into methamphetamine. So these two big-breasted meth fiend chicks, with nice pairs of tits on them, of course, set up meth production after watching Cooking Crank with Uncle Fester. I've never been down this street before, and I see they've gotten us into a bunch of dead ends. That's what I've done. Uncle Fester is fucked up. We'll back up and take the alternate route here. Turning to the weather, tomorrow there will be a favorable wind, together with yellow and green chlorine clouds over Ypres, as a German front moves in a westerly direction. France will shrink as Germany enlarges. The flames rage violently, threatening an end to life. And the world and this brief speech, the speech at least, has the advantage of being nearly over. Have you heard about the war on drugs? I got nailed by it and put in the slam. <laughs> yeah, I got gas in the trenches in that one. <laughs> The Allies are predicting unseasonably warm temperatures in Dresden today. A fire breaks out backstage in a theater. The clown comes out to warn the public. They think it's a joke and applaud. The clown repeats himself. The acclaim is even greater. I think that's just how the world will come to an end. Two general applause from those who believe it's a joke. Interesting physics experiment. Interesting physics experiment. Interesting physics experiment. For manufacturing and distributing crank, I got tagged for three and a half years in the pet. Today, massive doses of radiation are predicted for Hiroshima as the city plays host to an interesting physics experiment. Only someone who has been bit by snakes, knows what the victim of a snake bite suffers. I do believe each person possesses an inalienable right to control his own body chemistry. There's a story of how a French soldier who had campaigned in Russia had his leg amputated at the knee due to gangrene. As soon as the painful operation was over, he grabbed the leg by the foot, threw it in the air and shouted, Vive l'Amberin! That made me a radical, I guess. 
and I got into a shitload of trouble for it. Turning to the Americas, dark clouds are gathering. It was all quiet on the Western Front, then BAM! Drug war! This is not a watch, this is a warning. Genocide is not usually advertised. The authorities do not come right out and say, by the way, we are going to annihilate an entire segment of the population this afternoon. Save our children from the evil drug lords and the gangs. Save our boys and girls from the gangs. My enemies rent over and over and over. 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 over if you are anywhere in the computer projected path of this storm, take cover immediately. These things are not generally celebrated by their perpetrators. Their efforts are a bit more subtle. It's like I got caught up in some kind of witch hunt! The weather is highly unpredictable these days. As a consequence, it is very difficult to perceive when a Holocaust is actually in progress because it proceeds by and through the rule of law. My personal opinion is that dope fiends have been relegated to the status of the Jews and the final solution. You know, fit to be rounded up and sent to the camps. And that's about it. My books have definitely had an impact. Besides all of the people who follow my recipes to skirt the law, many critics acknowledge my books. Usually when I publish a new book or release a new edition of an old book, the authorities reconfigure the market to hinder my recipes. I update my books regularly because the narco swine are always fucking with my reactions. For example, the fourth edition of Seeds of Methamphetamine Manufacture, I published a couple methods for cooking amphetamine using Sudafed cold pills or Dexatrim diet pills. One method was just perfect for the extraction of a nice pure extract for the subsequent chemical conversion. Anyhow, they didn't take the narco swine six months and those ephedrine pills were chemically reformulated in such a manner that the old recipe just produced a bunch of slop. The most horrendous milkshake looking gunk you can imagine. I just knew lots of people were getting frustrated as all hell, you know. So, the fifth edition is out now with a completely new extraction method which will work just fine with the new pills. I wonder how long it will take for them to reformulate the pills and try to foil my new recipes. Lord knows, they'll try. The U.S. Congress even legislates mindful of Uncle Fester. Before the first edition of Silent Death in 1988, it was still legal in the United States to brew nerve gas and extract rice and all that sort of stuff. As long as you didn't wipe out a city block with it, the actual act of brewing it was no big deal. With the gas mask or out? Well, after the book came out, U.S. Senator for Wisconsin, Herb Cole, introduced his first bill to Congress, the Biochemical Terrorism Act of 1989, which made cooking nerve gas 
extracting rice and, and things like that illegal with a penalty of up to a life term for doing it. I'll tell you, if that guy is a senator, then I ought to be president. Another example, I think it's a methamphetamine manufacturer, was attacked by the Meth Act of 1996. It was sponsored by another Senate nemesis of mine, Diane Feinstein. It jacked up greatly if the penalties for cooking meth are made on in glassware for the purpose of cooking meth, a separate felony with a 10 year penalty. They also put the mail order sales of those pills under intense federal scrutiny. Yes, when Uncle Fester breaks wind in Green Bay, they hear it in DC. I'm in a publishing race with the authorities and their corporate cronies. Every time I write a new book, they answer it by passing new laws and altering the chemical formulas of the stuff they sell. It's like a religious war, really. <laughs> Both sides feel very righteous. In the mid-90s, I got a call from the Japanese TV network, TV Asahi. They wanted to come over to Green Bay and have a little chit-chat with Uncle Fester. Of course, I was honored. Great, great, great guys, come on out. Well, about a dozen of them came over, two of whom my neighbor Daryl identified as Japanese Secret Service types. Being a bar owner, Daryl can make them just by eyeballing them. In any event, they interrogated me politely. They kept calling me Festerson, Uncle Festerson. I had no idea what the hell was going on because, well, the US media had hushed up what was going on in Japan at the time. It turns out there had been a nerve gas attack in Japan. Not the subway attack everybody did hear about, but an attack about a year earlier. Must have been 94. A Japanese apartment complex was nerve gassed. Well, this was an interesting concept. I had been writing on this very topic for quite some time. Somebody put the idea into motion there. The Japanese wanted Fester Sign to help them track down the perpetrators of this attack, and I tried to help them out. They were thinking the gas was either Russian or American government in origin, but I nixed that theory real quick. After reviewing their chemical analyses, I told them I was sure the stuff was home-brewed nerve gas because it was too poorly brewed to have originated from a government stockpile. Later, they determined it was in fact really lousy home-brewed nerve gas produced by the whacked-out home Shinrikyo cult, and that the cult had apparently tried to follow a faster recipe. The police even discovered a dog-eared copy of Silent Death at their hideout. This cult is something special. It contains the cream of Japanese society. Can you imagine their spokesman, fresh out of prison for murder in the year 2000, is mobbed by thousands and thousands of teenage Japanese girls? I mean, what the hell is going on over there? Anyway, of the two attacks, the apartment complex one was actually better thought out than the stunt they pulled later in the subway tunnel. In the apartment complex, they got some of the nerve gas up in the air by sort of boiling it up, whereas in the subway, they just spilled it on the floor and relied on the passive evaporation, which is too slow. They should have used an aerosol to get that nerve gas up. That's the idea in the latest edition of Silent Death. Oddly enough, that idea came to me while I was watching a Green Bay Packers game. In the NFL, they have a cool zone in which huge cooling fans shoot a watery mist onto the players on the sidelines to cool them down. I thought to myself, that technique would work real well. I better update Silent Death right away. It's lucky that Crazy Cult didn't have the latest NFL edition of Silent Death down in that subway system. If that stuff had been airborne, then the trains would have pushed it all over town. Anyway, do you know that the Om Shinrikyo actually wear antenna on their heads? 
That was a popular Om Shinrikyo thing that I intended to put on their head. They jump up and down, and by doing that, they tune themselves in and pick up the thought waves of their great leader, that blind whatever the hell his name is. Now, what can you expect from people who wear antenna on their heads? They did extraordinarily well, all things considered, but they botched the goddamn batch, imbeciles. with me for the first two miles. He gets to say hi to everybody, and I get to piss on my favorite trees. Manchester gets tired, so I take his butt home and then do another four miles. You're the one who's got to come home. I'm the one who does another four miles. I'm 10 years old. Uncle Festa is 42 years old. I'm younger than an ancient statue, Uncle Festa. Dog years and human years ain't the same thing. I suffer from arthritis in my shoulder, and also I'm completely blind. Nevertheless, I still manage to crawl out Uncle Fester's bed and suck on his blankets and chew on his pillows all day long. Taking care of Uncle Fester is about as much work as taking care of his kids, Casey and Elisa. If I want to take him camping, I gotta drop Uncle Fester off at his folks' house. Cause if Uncle Fester come camping, I end up with two drunk kids! That's a lie! You're the one who's gonna be dropped off at my folks' house. Around the home, I usually know it is dingling but my Christian name is Bud Light. When I smell that, Festa calls me Nitwit. Uncle Festa get overly excited sometimes. Uncle Festa getting a little old and Uncle Festa is a big stupid. That's it. Give me the damn microphone. Okay, that poor dog, when it gets warm, even though I cut his fur right down to the hide, he still stinks to high heaven. Even if I give him baths with antibacterial soap, which should help, there's no improvement in the smell. He loves to rub it into the couch. He loves to rub it into my bed. He loves to run it into the carpets all over the house. <laughs> when I start up the vacuum cleaner, it sucks up this foul smell out of the carpet and ejects into the air of the home and just leaves the whole place reeking. A good doggy smell. It's like a rotted, fleshy smell. My ex liked to play baseball with the dog. She never liked to play the actual game itself there, you know. But uh, when it came to my dog, she took a different view of the game and really took to it. She had an upstairs bat and a downstairs bat, so she wouldn't have to go running up and down stairs for convenience sake. She'd clobber him with those bats right between the eyes, hit him, chase him around the house, run him outside, slug him, and bash him and beat him. She was a real punk. I don't like baseball. Imagine. She even tried to kill him once. She fed him some poison food. Like Ohm, she spilled the stuff right on the basement floor. I can't believe she lived with me for two years and that uh, we were a tag team duo for about seven years. She didn't pick up on a damn thing. One more thing she couldn't do right. From the murder attempt, Dingling was suffering through the most awful case of the squirts imaginable. Terrible, terrible. The poison's active ingredient was methamyl. But luckily, it was too damn old to kill him. Say, Dingling, you don't have any kind of residual chemical addiction to methanol, do you? Pardon? Something I ought to be worrying about? Uh -huh. 